Power TV, lifestyle and leadership integrated. Building a stronger nation, one woman at a time. Thinking about where my life would be if I hadn't given up the party isn't very inspiring. But then again, it's that vision that keeps me going sometimes. I know how low things can go, but maybe it's from these dark places that writers are born. I'm Kate Bergen. This is Power TV. Today, we sit down with award-winning author Susan Juby on how life is more manageable with laughter, comedy as a primary coping mechanism, and strategies to focus on goals, especially if your goal is being a writer. What is the story you can tell in a way that nobody else can tell? Move Me, Jody Jackson, golf and performance coach, connects mind, body, and spirit in the name of competition. Fuel Me, Sherry Strong, food philosopher, chef, and nutritionist, connecting vitality in your food with vitality in the bedroom, fueling your libido. And finally, our note to self, Steely Springham, inspirational conversationalist and coach, brings it all home, moving from inspiration into action. Power TV, this is what happens when Canadian women making an impact in sport, business, the arts, and community leadership come together. She's a successful writer with 12 novels to her credit, including The Republic of Dirt, which won the 2016 Leacock Medal for Humor in Writing. Her Alice I Think series was turned into a 13-part television series for CTV and the Comedy Network. She has a place, and I'm going to get this out correctly, at the table at the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, and is a teacher of creative writing at Vancouver Island University. Today we are celebrating author, writer, Susan Juby. Thank you for being here oh, and sharing here. this time. I read that you set out to write every kind of book that you ever wanted to read. Have you done that yet? I've come close, so all of my books are comedies, so that's the thread that runs through all of them. Um, but I'm very interested in genre writing, so I like um, all sorts of different genres. Crime, um, the one I have missed uh, is horror, so I have to figure out how to write a comedic horror novel. It's certainly been done. And it has to be comedy for you? Uh, it's sort of, um, uh, I've heard it described as uh, similar to cows giving milk like you sort of have a mode and so I'm that's my mode is I <laughs> give comedy and I do most of my books have serious elements as well but they're all like comedic is my basic sensibility so I'm gonna try a horror novel but I've written books with um, with uh, set on farms I've written because I'm interested in sort of agricultural comedies and you love horses and I love I've written a horse book I've got my little horse book out of the way and I've written a book set in an art school I love books about art so those aren't necessarily genres but they're areas I'm very interested in so the Globe yeah. and Mail described you as Canada's court jester how do you take that? <laughs> <laughs> a commentary on my fashion sense, maybe. Uh, no, it's, um, I thought that was a great compliment. Um, so I am a comedic writer, and it's great to be appreciated for what you do. And a court jester is, um, you know, has an important role in society. You know, you poke fun at things that need poking fun at. And, uh, you know, you can lighten the mood, add a bit of levity. And there's an element in, uh, I think, in that of um, telling the truth about stuff in a way that won't get you barred from the campaign. Uh, so it is, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And court jesters will point those sorts of things out. Um, so yeah, I thought I was I was tremendously pleased, and I might get myself a tasseled cap. I don't know. It's, <laughs> anything, anything's possible. I think you should. Do you do you purposely use comedy to to get at that truth, and and to maybe bring light to things that people keep in the dark? Probably. I think coping has been in my own life one of my primary, uh, or comedy has been one of my primary coping mechanisms. And so I have a sort of a theory that you can get through any kind of difficulty, hardship in your life if you're able to laugh about it. So it's a way of taking control of it. It's a way of putting things in perspective. 
and it's um, when I was young, I would I was very prone to um, depressive incidents where I would lay on the couch and listen to Nazareth's Love Hurts for many hours at a time. And so my mom's <laughs> remedy for this problem of mine was to give me funny books, and that's where I developed mm -hmm. an absolute passion for funny books, is because mm -hmm. they were the thing that would get me. Uh, okay, well, I guess I could get off the couch, maybe. <laughs> You're feeling a little lighter. Absolutely, you feel a little lighter. You, life feels more manageable, and it's just a break. I mean, life can be sort of grindingly stressful, and comedy is a way to um, just have some relief. Mm -hmm. yeah. You tried f a short while at a career in fashion design, mm -hmm. and I know that there's more layers to this question yeah. than there might seem at first, but what happened to that? How did you know that that wasn't right for you? Well, it's a, uh, so I have always been really interested in clothes. I went to school, I was uh, grew up in Smithers, BC, and I went off to school in Toronto to study fashion design. And my ultimate goal was to become a costume designer for film and TV. Um, but I was uh, 20 years old, having lots of personal problems, um, really, really serious personal You're problems. You're in recovery. Yes, oh. I'm in recovery. Uh, and so at that time, I was just, you know, I was not doing well. I wasn't going to get through any program. Um, but the other thing that I notice and I had to be honest about it is that I didn't have the passion for fashion um, mm -hmm. if you'll forgive the rhyme um, that some of my uh, the other students had and so they would you know they would work late and they were really I liked fashion because of what it told me about people I thought oh that's an interesting way to reflect this and what an amazing you know this person's demonstrating identity through this outfit but they had a, a much more thoroughgoing love of it so what I do now is I write about people and part of how I you know create a character is I think about how they've dressed, how they've chosen their clothes, what it says about them, all those mm. kinds of things. So it is, um, and you know, people want to experiment with, you know, interests, passions, whatever it happens to be. It's all worthwhile stuff. I'm not sorry that I spent a whole bunch of money that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. more with Susan Juby when we come back. Hi there, I'm Jody Jackson. Welcome to Move Me. And today I have a guest with me, Alex Faustin, who is a high performance junior golfer that I work with. And thank you for showing up here today. Oh. All right. Okay. Awesome. So today we're going to look at something called fluid motion. And it's something that Alex and I have been working on with regards to her high performance on the golf course. It's a body mind connection. Really, what we're trying to do is eliminate that overthinking and get into the intelligence of the body and own your motion. If you're a golfer, then you'd own your golf swing. If you're a tennis player, then you'd own that motion versus thinking through it. So the first thing we're gonna do here, Alex, is a little experiment to check to see if we're able to just connect an intention with the body intelligence. So let's grab these um, beautiful little implements that we have here, and let's just start with uh, maybe moving it up and down, down north and south, up that, there we go. So you can see that we're not really moving our hands too much, we're just anchoring our elbows here. And without thinking too much about it, we just set the intention and these keys and the, the uh, divot tool just started moving. So you name the next direction, which way do you want to go? Okay, counterclockwise, set the intention and see that just simply start reversing. Wow, look at how quick you are. So you see how that when you set that intention, the body takes over and we get our thinking mind, which is essentially our prefrontal cortex, out of the way. So the intention that we set is to hit a particular golf shot. Now this signal travels in this direction straight to the motor system. You saw it here when we were working with the, the example on the, uh, the wheel. However, if something else perceives that they need to get involved, which is our prefrontal cortex, and interferes with that signal saying, watch the angle, let your wrist joint, make sure you transfer your weight. This is the CEO, our discriminating intellect. And when this gets involved and interrupts that signal, we're in trouble and we no longer have that lovely fluid motion and that immediate mind-body connection. All right, so today we talked a little bit about high performance and how to create that fluid motion. A lot of people call it the zone. It's great for sport, of course, but there's also other things in life where you want to be really present, not overthinking. I know when you drove here today, did you think about your ankle joint when you were pressing your pedal on the car? No. So when we overthink things, we get ourselves in the way. I'm asking you to just set your intention 
and allow that body intelligence to show up. Uh, high performance, fluid motion, it can be yours with trusting that body-mind connection. Good luck. There was a time in Susan Juby's life when the goals and aspirations for a passionate life filled with writing and connecting with people was just not going to happen. Why not? Because uh, I was sabotaging myself with my lifestyle. I had a very, I was, I was very young. I was only 20, but um, from 13 to 20, I was a committed party animal. Um, and it was absolutely you know, blocking every avenue I had. I would set out with great intentions to accomplish something and I never seemed to make it happen. So I had to really make some big life changes in order to actually have a life, a big enough, you know, the, the kind of life that I wanted to have. And you knew what that life was. You were very clear on what you wanted. Well, I wanted to feel good about myself. I wanted to feel like I had a creative life. I wanted to feel like I was intellectually present and emotionally and spiritually present for my life. And um, so I had to, you know, give up that lifestyle and rebuild. Um, so I feel like in my 20s, I actually went through my adolescence. I, you know, start dating in a more normal way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I rebuilt every part of my life from 20 on. And that was a conscious. Um, decision for you? It was very much a conscious decision and uh, writing had been a goal that I'd had for a long time but I stopped writing when I was 13 and uh, it took me until I was 27 to have the confidence that I had something to say that somebody might possibly want to read. It took me seven years of a new life to even try to put myself out there as a writer. And that first was Alice, I think. It was, which I didn't, you know, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to go write a novel. I said, I'm going to write this little thing on the bus. Maybe it'll be something, maybe it won't. But I feel good every morning when I do my writing on the bus and later in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And it did turn into my first novel. So you have goals that you set very clearly for yourself. How do you go about setting your goals and then achieving them? Because any, there's a lot of people who try to be writers mm -hmm. and it's not easy. It takes a lot of self-discipline and you seem to have that. Yeah, I do. So it's for me, it's a combination of things. I love a good goal. I just, they're like pets to me, having goals. So every year I <laughs> do you set... Do name them and actually I do the <laughs> novel number five, is that's the goal, yeah. or, you know, make this particular thing happen, and it's usually, or you know, organized around my career. So I have five-year goals, I have one-year goals, and every year I, I check and see, oh, did you do it? Did you... And it's remarkable to me that I, you know, for the most part, those goals get met. Um, and so the other thing I do is I'm a heavy list maker mm -hmm. and the first thing on my list is always get your writing done and it doesn't I started out very modestly I didn't need to write very much but I wanted to write five or six days a week and so that's what I tell people who are interested is for eight tumultuous hours at a don't keyboard do don't. No. your head will explode if you try to do that or you you'll do it once and you'll never want to do it again so right. I tell people get yourself a delicious coffee shut off the cell phone put the internet just get yourself away from all that stuff and just try to see what happens and try to entertain yourself make yourself cry make yourself laugh how do you keep the, the big goals, the five-year goals, manageable every day? Because if you look at the big picture and sort yeah. of always have that over top of you, it can get overwhelming, and then you stop succeeding yeah. because it's just too hard. It's too big. So I set those big goals, the one-year, five-year, whatever it happens to be, and then I don't think about them very much. What I do is say, well, what should I do today to be here um, in a year or six months or a month? Um, and so everything's broken down, broken down. And uh, it makes my life sound unfun, but uh, there's nothing I love more than checking off my daily list. And for me, the rule is if you um, achieve 80 percent of the things on your list then you had a great day <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah. you do celebrate and it doesn't have to oh, be totally. perfect no not at all and I also put on my list I put stuff that you know go into the gym I put uh, it's not just one area I try to take care of all my areas mm -hmm. you know if it's a trying to do three meditation retreats a year or whatever it happens to be like all that stuff and does that um, help you with your work and your writing is it all sort of interwoven it does. yeah I mean I've learned from different women that I know about having you know the different aspects of your life you tend to them, nurturing them like a garden, even I'm not a good gardener, but I can tend to different mm -hmm. aspects of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. That um, helps me to, uh, you know, I don't know how you create consistently. Maybe you can have a burst of creativity, but I don't think it's going to be sustained unless you are looking after yourself. It's creativity on, on demand almost if you want to keep outputting to the degree yeah. that you are. You need to be tended, yeah, um, in all your different aspects. Do you forgive yourself? 
on oh. a daily basis if you're maybe you don't make 80 percent maybe one day is 60 percent absolutely maybe. some days it's five percent i got out of bed Woo! good for me and um, what is the self-talk that happens uh, when you're something i had to learn was the self-talk that was more productive so the self-talk is um okay so this day didn't happen very successfully let's try tomorrow's going to be better. So, and also if I have a day where I'm not productive, my talk to myself is just let's embrace not being productive. Go lay down on the floor, stare at the ceiling, enjoy yourself. Enjoy it. <laughs> exactly. Experience it for what Experience it is. Experience it, be present for it, whatever it happens to be, go for it. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. We do have a lot of aspiring writers and successful writer, writers in our midst at Powerhouse. We're going to share some very specific tips on how to improve and become a better writer when we come back with Susan Juby. When I get that feeling, I get sexual healing. Oh my goodness. Uh, singing's not part of my sexual healing, just so you know. But we are talking about something that most of us are very interested in, and that is sex. And what we're finding now is that modern living is creating a massive blow to libido. And if you are finding that you're not cooking so much in the bedroom, it could have something to do with what's cooking in your kitchen. And it's not so much a lack of aphrodisiacs, but there are foods that you may be eating unwittingly, even thinking they're healthy, that are literally sucking the love right out of you. So here are some funky foods that might actually be inhibiting you getting funky. Sodas. Now, it's not just the sugar sodas, which definitely will impact your libido, but we're finding now that diet sodas too can impact your serotonin levels and lead to not so much bubbles and love in the bedroom. And although popcorn might be a great thing to have on romantic movie nights, you definitely don't want microwave popcorn. It has chemicals like perfluorooctanoic acid found in the bag's lining that can actually kill your sex drive and over long term has even been linked to prostate problems. Soy, now this might surprise you too, but half a serving of soy in a Harvard School of Public Health discovered that it can actually slash sperm count by 40% in healthy males. That's pretty amazing. Cheese too, if it's loaded with synthetic hormones, which means if it's not a natural cow, it's going to mess with both estrogen and testosterone in males. And alcohol, we all love a little something alcoholic when we're having a romantic night but it's actually a depressant that can play havoc with a man's ability to achieve and maintain an erection and dampen libido for both sexes. And oddly, beer is actually one of the worst libido killers. So if you're noticing a slump and desire for sex in the bedroom, get into the kitchen, give up the processed foods and get inspired by nature. And if you're looking for more tips, tools, strategies, and recipes for a powerful way to nourish, energize, and protect your body, go to returntofood.com. The ducks. Language is fundamental to cultural identity. Uh, this is important for all people, not just indigenous peoples, but for all people. It's a way of communicating and expressing oneself uh, about your world, your values, your beliefs, your customs, your traditions, your food, your art, your culture, your dance. All of these forms is a way of communicating values and beliefs. and. Um, the importance of revitalizing language is basically up to each and every one of us individuals to learn and transfer that mother tongue. Um, here I am interacting, engaging with the community of youth, just the handful of them, but making sure that it's interactive, fun, and engaging so that it's meaningful but full of feelings and emotions of, of um, wellness and looking at keeping that language and maintaining what it is that we do have so that our future generations will be able to consider themselves as or an identity that they can relate to based on their cultural roots and the foundation of where they come from as a community. It is based on shared values and beliefs that has been passed down from generations to generations 
And um, with a distinct language, we are able to identify who we are and where we belong to. Many of us aspire to be successful, intriguing, interesting, creative writers telling our story. My first novel was published when I was, I believe, about five. Runaway Sally was the name of my book, and you had wanted a similar mm -hmm. age. When was your first novel published? Grade two, so, and it was about a girl who goes to space with her dog. Right. Yeah, a classic of its kind. <laughs> Do you still have it? Uh, no, it's still in the archives of oh. St. Joseph's Elementary School, I understand. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Or, that is... or not. <laughs> I think that's um, just a little segue to get into. We, many of us have an innate desire to be writers, mm -hmm. um, but becoming one is a very different thing than wanting to be one. How do you move from wanting to becoming when it comes to writing? Well, I think, um, I mean, it is telling that kids often write a lot. And because nobody's told them they don't have anything interesting to say, they still believe, oh, I had a thing and it's a story I want to share and creativity is part of what I just do. And, and we're encouraged. And the kids are they're encouraged. encouraged. And as adults, we're told, you get serious now. Do something productive. And so we have to let go of that stuff to start writing. Um, and so for me, I had a long writer's block. Um, you know, Seven from years. 13 to 27. Right. Uh, so that's a long... Longer than seven. Yeah, longer than seven. And so what I had to do is break it down, like I break down everything, and that meant trying to write, uh, you know, a few, you know, for a, at least a couple of hundred words a day. Um, and I had to break it down to say, it doesn't matter if it's any good, um, you know, it, just write something. And if you keep writing something good that is interesting to you, that is um, stimulating to you, will come out and then you'll have something to work with. And that's the key, stimulating and interesting to you, yes. not to what you think well, other, other people thing. are going to be interested in. Yeah, that because uh, I think people set out to write the great Canadian novel, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's they, already been done. You, you've it's done already, it. Uh, exactly. Well, so I've, right. I've, yeah. yeah. Um, but the other piece is that they um, think they have to write a certain way instead of finding their own voice. So that's what I tell all of my students is, what is your voice? What is the story you can tell in a way that nobody else can tell? Do you think people think that their story is the same as everybody else's? And, and maybe we assume that we can even see our own uniqueness in what we choose to write, but maybe we can't even see it. I think sometimes the only way you can see it is by practicing your writing right. or whatever your creative thing is going to be is like finding, and that's just a practice thing. You keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep refining it until you do find your voice. So, um, and that is, it's not something that, some people just show up to the page, whatever it happens to be like, or the painting, you know, the canvas, and they have a very particular style. Other people have to figure out, you know, they mimic other people and that's totally acceptable, but they have to keep doing it until they find it out. You did that. You kept doing it. Did I you did. ask for input from other people? So after, you, and when you get that feedback, mm -hmm. you can choose to take it or leave it. Yes, and my first feedback is I wrote my first novel very secretively, and then I gave it to Which my... Which was Alice, I think. Alice, I think, okay. and I didn't tell anybody I was writing. I didn't even admit that it was a novel, but I showed it to my godfather, who was also my uncle, and he said his first words about it were, sometimes when we really love a writer, we write like that writer, which meant that I had written a novel that was, um, at least the beginning of which, was very derivative of one of my favorite comic writers, who's a woman named Sue Townsend. And I was thrilled. I thought, derivative, yes! Um, <laughs> And then he read more and he said, oh, but I think you're onto something like that's specifically you in here too. So um, that is, you know, I start by, you know, emulating the people that I admire and then I develop my own thing. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a bit about the balance between writing as an, as an isolated mm -hmm. activity, but then ha needing that support system around you and that feedback and those mentors and the balance between the two. So writing is a weirdly isolating thing. So I write in the morning generally uh, and writers spend a lot of time complaining with one another on the internet mm -hmm. so that's where some, <laughs> some of the support comes in um, but that could be negative support or is, is that constructive I think it's just a way of um, release it's a it's a bit of a release uh, but when it's time when you have something to show somebody the, with writing it's not like doing a painting so it takes so long to write a novel it 
takes months to years to write a novel and most people don't necessarily show it as it's in progress so I don't show anybody until I have a, a third or fourth draft um, and then it goes out to the people that I trust so diff I have a little group of writers that I trust and I have um, some people in my family that I trust and then after they've read it then I give it to my editors and uh, so it's a long you have to really have an ability not to get a lot of positive feedback for a long time when sometimes what you really want is a big pat on the back you have to give it to yourself say that was a great sentence you good Cause job because nobody, nobody else knows about it yeah or they might not tell you yeah um, and sometimes you're going to get um, f you know you're not going to get the support you need lots of a surprising number of people don't get the support creatively that they need in their lives so they have to go and find those communities that are supportive mm -hmm. you mentioned trust mm -hmm. what are the elements of trust that you look for when, when being very vulnerable and, and yeah. putting the work out and saying, here's where it is right now. Yeah. Uh, so for me, the trust is, it's a two-part trust. So the first trust is that the person has good aesthetic sense and that they have good sensibility. And the second part of the trust is that they will also tell me the truth. So if it's completely lousy, they will tell me it's lousy in a way that helps me make it better as opposed to crushes my spirit and sends me to bed with depression. <laughs> And that then comes right back to being very clear on what the end game is. The yeah. end game is to put out a good, a good novel. Yeah. yeah. And so half my time is spent writing it, half my time is spent fixing it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you'll write a novel about this experience one day. Absolutely. I'll become we'll become one of the characters in your books. Yes. Um, so we're going to ask you to to read us um, an affirmation from the turtle. And so there's only two left. Okay. So you can pick one of them. <laughs> and then uh, read it out loud for us. And we'll end our time together on this note today. I love this. Powerful women understand that beautiful is a feeling, not a size. Nice. Very true. Thank you. Thanks. When we were kids, creativity flourished. <laughs> Laughter came easy. And we somehow knew anything was possible. And it was our imagination that was our strongest tool and our most trusted ally. Oh, we thrived in color and in laughter. And then somewhere, somewhere along the way, we got serious. Life, it got in the way. And so too did the needs of others. Or maybe, maybe we just got in our own way sabotaging our dreams, silencing our laughter, closing our mind's eye to where we were only seeing in black and white and existing in gray. No passion. But then suddenly, suddenly life, life gives you a little nudge, that pat on the back, a gift. Laughter ignites a small flame of passion. Self-talk becomes productive and far more forgiving. You find a voice and you celebrate daily all of your triumphs. You pat yourself on the back and you color laughter back into your life. Note to self, color your life in laughter. <laughs>